Good morning. Let's see, I'm going to do something a little different today. Can you imagine that? <laughs> um, so yesterday, uh, we've actually been a little sick in my house. You might be able to hear it. I got some honey lemon tea up here. So I'm not quite hitting on all eight cylinders. You might have to help me out a little extra, okay? So, uh, but yesterday we got up and Abby says, um, hey, I've got a great idea. Let's go out to this uh, sunflower farm. She's not here today because the kids are sick and she's, she's sick and whatever. So, and I'm like, great. <laughs> and I'm notoriously grumpy and like, just kind of like, oh, it's my first day kind of back on my feet. So we jump in the car. I go, okay, we, we get in the car, we drive out to this place and we meet a couple um, who, uh, th their name is uh, Dean and Susan Lanier. And they begin to tell us um, how uh, they have a farm called Old River Farms and they have cultivated this huge patch of sunflowers. Anybody seen that or heard it? A, a couple of you, okay. So the Instagram handle, if you wanna look it up, is Old River Farms NC. Um, or you could look up Abby, my wife, Abby Mattis, um, and she's already posted. Uh, but, but what was amazing, she's an avid Instagrammer, but what was amazing is we got out there and they began to tell us this story of how they uh, were so moved by what is happening in Ukraine and this Russian war on the Ukrainians and they have some friends and they know some people and they wanted to do something to aid and to support uh, Ukraine. So what they did is they d used what they had. They had acreage, so they take their tractors out and they till this big plot of land and they planted sunflowers and they begin to put it out there and they have people come and you buy sunflowers um, by the stem, like a dollar a stem. And so all these photographers start coming. What are photographers doing? Taking photos, right? And so they're posting them and everybody's hashtagging them. And so it's this little movement that's begun and they've partnered with a uh, group out of, it's a nonprofit, Ukrainians in the Carolinas out of Raleigh. And what was so fascinating both to Abby and I is they have spent months and months cultivating this little piece of property. They've donated all their time. They've donated all their energy. They donated their farm equipment. They donated the acreage. They've like put it all towards this. And they have said, hey, everything that we get uh, financially from this, we're going to give to this organization, a nonprofit called Ukrainians in the Carolinas, um, and they're funneling it to Ukraine to actually help people. There's no overhead, there's no salaries, it's like all like going right to the deal. Pretty amazing, right? So I don't usually do this, but I'm going to do something that's a, it's a little bit uncharacteristic. But I looked at them yesterday as I was walking out and I said, how much have you raised? Here's how much they've raised, $7,098.50. I had them text me last night. So this has taken them months to get here. And I said, you know what? We never do stuff like this, but I am so moved. And we are, we're just, as the American church, we're always at risk of being inward focused and kind of aware only of what's going on with us. And I'm gonna stand in front of our church tomorrow and ask if they would consider matching what you guys have raised over all these months. So that's $7,098.50. So here's what I'd like you to prayerfully consider doing. This is, we have a little box in the back for tithes and offerings, that's where people give. But if you would be willing to give to that, we're gonna give 100% of it if you earmark your check, Ukraine, um, or if there's some envelopes that Carol has back there, if you wanna put them in there. But let's see if we can't match what this couple has done um, at this farm uh, called Old River Farms NC and see if we as a church can't come up with $7,098.50 to match what they've done. Can we do that? All right. I think if we did the math, like if everybody gave 20 bucks, we'd probably be there. I mean, really. Online, you can do the same thing. You got to earmark it. I don't know if you can give online and earmark it. I think you can. That's above my pay grade. So try and send us an email and say you did and tell us it was earmarked and we'll make sure it gets there. Okay. Questions? Am I being clear on that? Let's continue to be a church that champions people bigger than us, beyond us, and celebrate what Jesus is doing way beyond our walls. Amen? Come on, that's the heart of God. Okay, prayerfully consider giving. Let's give big and see if we can match their $7,098. Was it 798? 
Thank you. See, I'm already missing it. Thanks, Matt. There you go. Okay, I am in um, John 13. Um, we are, as you can see, even with worship, we believe in a relatively um, profound God and very human simplicity. We want to introduce you to the person of Jesus in worship, in the Word. Um, and so we are going through the book of John. We're coming down to the end of John, where Jesus is actually moving towards um, the culmination of his earthly ministry, which was going to death on a cross and then actually resurrecting um, from that death. I'm going to pick up in verse 18. Um, and, and what we're looking at here, and in fact, I'm reading out of an NIV, um, but Jesus is actually talking about his betrayal. So l let me set the table just with a couple of thoughts, and we're going we're gonna to try to unpack this in such a way and then, and then shift and pivot at the end to really looking at what is this divine love, what is love, what is human love, and then see if we can't even make some application on what kind of love Jesus is loving um, the disciples with and see if we can actually pull some of that or learn from some of that and inject it into our marriages, our families, our friendships, Okay. So, so that's where we're going. But let's start with this idea of betrayal um, just a second, because that's one of the things that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about Judas. Um, and we all love to hate Judas, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm glad. Thank you for laughing. I appreciate that. <laughs> I always find that I'm uh, funniest when I'm not trying. <laughs> when I try to be funny, they come off like these dad jokes, and so I'm just like, oh, well, whatever. Um, thanks, Emily. Uh, <laughs> So anyway, um, I, I, was, I was just sort of going through a time in my own life, because that's what we're getting ready to look at here is when Jesus was betrayed, but a time in my own life when I was betrayed, and it actually happened um, in these hallways here at Roland Grice Middle School. Isn't that funny? But um, I was a student here, and I developed a friendship, and Abby and I would always tell our kids, um, hey, don't have a best friend, have many best friends right? Just have many best friends. Like, have lots of them. It's a good thing. But the moment you, like, you know, singular, singular sing, make one person your singular best friend, you eliminate the possibility of other people from being your best friends, too. You know what I'm saying? Okay. So, but contrary to our advice to our kids, I had sort of made this one buddy of mine um, a really, really good friend. I would probably even have called him a best friend. And so we graduated um, from wherever we are, Rolling Grace Middle School, and we went on over to John T. Hoggard. And we got to Hoggard, and there was a group of senior guys, without going into it too much, um, who thought I was a young punk that should be picked on and harassed. Like, really. I had this tall hair, um, and I walked with this bounce in my step. I was probably arrogant, and what, who knows what I was. Um, and I actually had hair, believe it or not. If you don't believe me, I'll pull out a photo and prove it to you. But there was a group of senior guys, and they really, I mean, I was bullied really bad. Like, beat up a couple of times, like, really, really bad. And the first time it happened, um, there was this public group at Hoggard High School, a public setting, and there was like 2,500 kids there then. So I'm walking up onto this, um, this area where all these, these kids are gathered, and there's a big circle of them, 30 or 40 of them. And you know that little loop on your backpack? You know, they grabbed that loop on my backpack, and they drug me into the middle of their circle. Right, And then they started like, um, you know, ping-ponging me around. I'm like this freshman kid, and they're these senior guys. And, um, but it really wasn't what they did that bothered me. What bothered me is this guy that I thought was my best friend um, was standing like right outside the circle. And I'll never forget, because I'm in the middle of this thing, and I look up over at him. And he looks at me and then goes... And then not only that, he stepped into the circle and decided to join in. He never put, punched me or hit me, or, but he just stood there with all of them. And I remember going, I mean, I, what they did that day and, what, you know, a few little lumps on my head or whatever, none of that meant anything compared to what I was feeling inside in that moment where I was like, I thought you were my friend. Like, I feel totally betrayed. So now, maybe even think of your own life, a time when you've felt betrayed, and I want to look at this story through that lens, but then I want you to actually upgrade that, and I want us to begin to look at the love of Jesus. What is divine love as compared to human love? How is it that he loves the way he loves? And then we're going to see if we can even pivot and begin to um, call ourselves into a deeper, more significant understanding and an expression of divine love. Does that make sense? All right, let's try. 
Here we go. So I'm going to start reading. Um, I'm in John 13. I'm going to start reading in verse 18. And we're going to unpack it. I am not referring. Uh, no, I, didn't, I didn't say this. I got to say this. Okay. Jesus has just done what? Wash their feet. If you weren't here last week, you can go back and watch it. But he's just washed their feet. So we've got to like, get inside this just a second. Jesus is the king of heaven. He shucks his kingdom, he shucks his power, he shucks his authority. He comes down and he takes on a baby. Can you get any more helpless? Not only that, but he takes on the, a, a, a Jewish race. That's a race that has been discriminated against, hurt, hassled, killed, hated. Um, he, take, he becomes a baby, he becomes a Jewish man, and then of all of the Jews, he is hated and discriminated against. And then the guys he decides to roll with are 12 people who are most hated and discriminated against also. Okay, so Jesus has stepped out of his ultimate kingdom power and authority into earth. He has taken on the likeness of an absolute servant, and then they're at this last supper meal. And while he is there with these guys who are fishermen, tax collectors, scoundrels, uh, you know, rejects from society, he not only goes, not only is he there uh, now teaching them and leading them, but he puts a towel around his waist and he's bending down in front of each of them and he's washing their feet. So he is now taking on the likeness of a literal servant, okay? So he's going around the room and he's washing each of their feet. And that's where we pick this up. Now, verse 18, I am not referring to all of you. I know those I have chosen, but this is to fulfill this passage of scripture. He who shared my bread has lifted up his heel against me. Now, some things in the Bible are just like, what? I mean, like, what? Is, this is Jesus talking. What? What? Okay, so he's not referring to all of you. So he's probably referring to? One of you, okay, uh, I know the ones I've chosen, but this is to fulfill the passage of scripture. He who shared my bread has lifted up his heel against me. <clears throat> okay, so um, he who shared my bread, we're gonna get into this in a minute, but Jesus is actually gonna take a piece of bread and he's gonna sop it in some wine and then he's gonna hand it to, to Judas. We'll talk about that in a minute. But this idea that he's lifted up his heel against me. Um, let's get into the Palestinian man's head uh, just a second. If you're in Palestine, and let's say you have your family, and out comes a snake, and you don't have a staff, okay? What are you gonna try to kill the snake with? Are you gonna get down and hit it with your hand? Are you gonna do an elbow drop? Are you gonna do a knee drop? All right, what are you gonna, what are you gonna kill it with? Your heel, okay? So when it says, um, he, he who shared my bread, so Jesus is about to share his bread, has lifted up his heel against me. This doesn't um, really do justice in our minds, but this is the same vehemence that you would go to kill a snake. Okay, so it is this, what, what is being said here is, you, uh, this person who he's about to share his bread with, has been violent or has violently betrayed or will violently betray. So you have hated me and done the absolute worst to me, like you would a snake on the ground. Does that make sense? Okay, so back to it. So he who shared my bread has lifted up his heel against me. Verse 19. Now, you've got these disciples sitting around going, what? Like, what is he talking about? And Jesus has told them plainly, I think they could have known, but they just couldn't deal with it, so they didn't know. Verse 19, I'm telling you now before it happens. Now, what's he telling them? He's gonna be betrayed. He's also been telling them he's gonna what? He's gonna die. Okay, I'm telling you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am, I am. What's he saying? So in the Old Testament, uh, Exodus 3, 14 and 15, if you want to look it up, God introduced himself to Moses as I am. So Jesus is saying here, I am. Let's say that together. Jesus is saying, I am. He's saying I'm God. All right. That's what he's saying. Crystal clear. Very truly I tell you, verse 20, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me. Okay, so Jesus sends you, someone who accepts you, accepts who? Jesus, God, okay. And whoever accepts me, accepts the one who sent me. Who sent him? 
Yahweh God. That's exactly right. So you're, you're getting it. So he's actually likening already. He's sitting with some guys who would have been considered scoundrels in the day, and he's already likening them because uh, they're with him. He's with God. They're with God. All of a sudden, he's introducing this idea that we become sort of uh, heirs with him. We become brothers with him. We become sons of God like he is a son. I mean, it's sort of transcendent what he's, he's introducing to these guys. Okay, so verse 20. 21, after he have said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit. This is a deeply troubled, this is like aggravated, this is hurt, this is he's in pain. This is like, um, this is such a deep hurt because Jesus knows what's coming. This is perhaps the closest I could get in this moment was Michael when I'm sitting in this group of guys who are in the middle of hurting me and I look up and I see the eyes of my friend and he looks away. Okay, that's times a million is what we have going on here. Okay. <clears throat> After he said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and he testified, very truly I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. Okay. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. Can you imagine the fear that probably went through the room? Could it be me? Maybe it's me. Is it you? One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Now, who's the disciple whom Jesus loved? That's John the Beloved, who wrote this book. Yeah, John probably didn't write it in his own hand, but he at least told him and they penned it. Okay, verse 24. Simon Peter motioned to the disciple and asked him, and uh, asked, ask him which one he means. So what's Simon Peter doing? So Simon Peter knows how to get what he wants, right? Is he asking Jesus? No, he's saying, John the Beloved, ask. Okay, so let's, let's get our head into this just a minute because I think it'll, it'll be powerful. Um, this was a small upper room, probably at a guy named John Mark's house. Um, they're, they're reclining. They're celebrating this um, Passover meal together. Jesus is, this is his, this last supper that he's having. And so Jesus uh, would have been sitting at a table that would have been a U, like a solid wooden block um, sort of U-shaped thing. Does that make sense? And around that you were these like couches, not like we think of couches, but like reclining couches. And traditional to like uh, Jewish culture, they would have reclined on their left elbow and it would have kept the right hand for what? Eating, that's right. And it's like this long event. It's like this hangout thing where they're like, you know, they're hanging and they're eating and they're talking. Now, if John the Beloved is resting his head on Jesus's chest, where is John sitting? Jesus is on his left elbow, eating food. John the Beloved is resting his head on Jesus' chest. Where's John sitting? To his right. Okay, so John the Beloved is sitting on Jesus' right. So you get the idea that Simon Peter's probably over here somewhere. Um, so let's keep going. Now, now hold that. Um, leaning back, now this is verse 25, leaning back against Jesus. Who is this? This is John the Beloved. He asked him, Lord, who is it? So there's this like sidebar conversation. You have Jesus leaning and Jesus is eating. You have John who leans back against Jesus and says, Lord, who is it? Peter's probably sitting over here. The rest of the disciples are gathered around. This is gonna be important in just a minute. So hang with me and let's see what Jesus said. Jesus answered, it is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas the son of Simon Iscariot. And as soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. So Jesus told him, what you're about to do, do quickly. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Okay, let's try to unpack this because this is so powerful if we can get it. Lord Jesus, help us. <clears throat> Okay, so Jesus is at the table. He, is, he would be the one who's facilitating the whole meal. He's facilitating conversation. He's facilitating interacting. Um, the most important seat uh, would have actually been to Jesus' left. 
Okay, that was the seat of the highest honor. A seat of high honor also would have been to his right. And he obviously would have asked John the Beloved to be sitting in that seat. Now, it's clear to me as I read this whole text, and I haven't even read all the way um, through it, but if, I, if we kept reading, um, you, get, you see this idea that Jesus is having a couple of these little sidebar conversations with Judas, and not everyone in the room hears. You follow me? Okay, so where then most likely is it that Judas is sitting? On his left. Okay, now, a couple things that are really, really important. The most honored seat at one of these events would have been the left, okay? And why that is absolutely fascinating and even transformative in the, in the way we think is in order for a person to take that seat at one of these little uh, dinners, well, the, the, the master of the ceremony or the host would have had to invite the person, okay? So uh, John got invited to sit where he was sitting, and Judas would have then got invited to sit where he was sitting. Okay, so I want you to think of something. If you're Jesus, and you have full knowledge and recollection and, and of past, present, and future, and you understand you're about to get betrayed, you understand who's going to betray you, and you're also able to look into the future and know that, man, uh, Peter is going to lead the church in Jerusalem, James is going to lead the church in Jerusalem. Uh, I mean, uh, John the Beloved is going to be exiled on Patmos. He's going to write Revelation. He's going to uh, lead the church in Ephesus. So if you're Jesus and you're looking into uh, the future, knowing all that's going to happen, who are you going to give the highest seat of honor to? Not Judas. Right? Right? There's a lot of people that he could his even, there's probably two Jameses in the room. One of the Jameses is probably his half-brother. The other James was the brother of John. Um, he could have even given it to, to, to family or to blood, but he gives it to Judas. And this tells me a couple of things. I think the disciples have actually grown um, accustomed to Judas getting some extra privileges. Now, Judas was the keeper of the what? The money. So all, the, all of a sudden you have that uh, Judas has already been elevated by Jesus. He's been picked. He's been chosen. And so I am reading between the lines here, but I'm going, I think it is clear that Jesus keeps picking Judas. Now why? Of all the people that you could have sit in that seat, I mean, 10 of those 11 guys are gonna be killed and crucified. John's the only one who will die of natural causes for Jesus. Of all the people that Jesus could pick and put in that most honored and trusted seat, why Judas? You gotta get this, because if you can get it in your mind and in your heart, I think it'll transform the way you see God, yourself, and people forever. This is the God that so loves people. This is the God that so believes in people. This is the God that understands what Judas is about to do, that he's about to sell him and betray him, and it's gonna lead Jesus right to the cross. But this is the God who is gonna give Judas every last chance. He loves him so much, he goes, hey Judas, sit next to me in this seat of honor. Sit next to me in this seat and let me love on you and give you another opportunity to choose rightly and so that I don't lose you for eternity. Like, you get this idea that this Jesus is so a lover of people, this song that uh, Daniel led us in up here, this reckless love. That's what actually is being illustrated here. Jesus is so recklessly in love with people that he takes the one who is gonna hurt him the most and promotes him next to him and gives him every opportunity to turn. Okay, now let's go a step further. I don't even know if I read it yet. So glad I'm entertaining. <laughs> I did read it. Okay. Jesus answered, it is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Okay, I mean, this is weird, right? We're like, what? Can you imagine like being at a dinner party? And I mean, like, you know, we're all uptight about germs and everything else, but you know, I take a little piece of bread and I'm like, ooh, I'm gonna sop it in my wine or something. And then I'm gonna come give it to you. You know, maybe I've nibbled on it, and now I've sopped it. And now Here, Karen. Like, for us, it's like, what? That's kind of gross, right? 
but you got to understand something. In this culture, um, uh, let, let, me, let me reframe it like this, see if we can understand it. Uh, Abby, my wife, tells this story about meeting the president when she was like eight or 10 or 12. I don't know how old she was. But she met the president, and she got to shake his hand. And guess what she said? I'm never going to. Okay, you, you guys have said that, right? I'm never gonna wash my hand. And it took her like whatever, however many hours and she washed her hand, right? But it's this same idea that you take someone who is the master of the ceremony, you take someone who is in the seat of great importance, you take someone who is in great honor and they take their morsel or this little tidbit and they're gonna dip it in their thing and then they're gonna hand it to you. It's this huge thing of honor. It's like, I've been chosen. It's like, you know, you pick your famous rock star or your famous uh, sports person or your famous whoever you follow and like or whatever, and you go sit and have a meal with them, and it's like they give you their best. It's like they're, they're taking what was meant for them, what was meant for, it was, it was gonna uh, nourish them, and they give it to, you understand? So, so it's like we read this from this Western idea and like, this is weird, you know, soppy bread. But when you see it from this like rabbinic um, Palestinian ideal, all of a sudden you have Jesus who goes, okay, of all my disciples, um, I know you 11 are gonna walk with me. You're gonna walk with me to the end. In fact, 10 of you are gonna pay for the gospel of Christ Jesus with your very lives. But the one who is at risk of being lost, not just on planet earth, but lost into the abyss of eternal darkness is Judas. And so I'm actually in my great love, I'm gonna reach out to Judas and say, Judas, come take the position of highest honor next to me, take my left hand seat. And then not only that, the final act of love is not Jesus revealing who is gonna betray him, although he utilized it for that purpose, but is Jesus actually reaching out and saying, I am giving you Judas the very best of what I have. I am offering you the best of who I am. I am willing to give you absolutely everything in the kingdom. Will you turn? Will you allow your heart to be tenderized and softened towards me? Will you turn from this course that you are on? And what do you think would have happened if Judas would have turned? I think he'd have turned and somebody else would have betrayed Jesus. That's what I think would have happened. I am convinced with everything in me that this is such a God of love that he is here offering Judas every last opportunity. So I wrestle with this idea that it's when Jesus, okay, uh, Jesus answered, verse 26, it is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I've dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, what's it say? Why? Why? I think we have the ultimate watershed moment where Jesus is like, I have loved you for three years. I have given you every opportunity. I have invited you. I gave you a place of honor among all of the disciples to, to watch over the money, to give money to the poor. I have given you my greatest seat of honor at this final dinner. I've given you my morsel tidbit that I've dumped in my own, the thing that was gonna be sustenance for me. I've given it to you. And at that moment, Judas so hardens his heart that that's the moment where the watershed happens and Judas is lost. But you've got to understand this is the God of love. And if, you know, Christians get all um, worked uh, up over the idea of hell, this is a good way to probably look at it. If God allows someone to go into eternal darkness, it's like this. He is gonna reach for him every single minute, every single opportunity he has, and he's gonna keep reaching and he's gonna keep loving and he's gonna keep pursuing. He's always gonna leave the 99 to go after the one. He is never gonna let anyone go unless at the end of the day, they have absolutely refused and refused and refused and refused and rejected and rejected and rejected. And finally he goes, I've done all I can do. And that's what happens with Judas. And I think Judas enters into eternal darkness at that point. So Jesus told him, verse 27, what you are about to do, do quickly. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had the charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. When they celebrated Passover, it was common that they'd go out and give something to the poor. So it was just in keeping. Verse 30, as soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out 
and it was night. You, you also get this idea there, it was night. It's just this, um, I, John is always lifting up the, har, the, the larger um, sort of view. So you get this light and darkness, day and night. And, and Judas is illustrating, um, you know, it was night. Night is ruling and reigning in this moment. And in some ways, this is hard to say out loud or theologically, but in some ways you have Jesus in this moment who is admitting defeat. I've lost Judas. Does he hate Judas? No. Does he extend love to Judas? Every single time he loves him again, he loves him again, he loves him again, he loves him again. Let's keep reading. We're going to see if we can pivot into this divine love versus human love. When he was gone, Jesus said, now the son of man uh, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. Remember glorified? Jesus is glorified two ways. He's glorified because he's lifted up, right? Glorified means lifted up. So he's glorified by being lifted up on the cross. He's raised up on the cross. And then he's glorified because when he goes into the tomb, buried, dead, buried, he is actually lifted up, and he breaks the power of death and hell. So he's glorified in, in sort of this double way. God is glorified in him. Verse 32. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself, and he will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me just as I told the Jews. So I tell you now where I am going, you cannot come. Again, these guys are scratching their heads like, what? Verse 34, here it is. A new command I give you, love one another. As I, has loved, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus replied, where I'm going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Verse 37, Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Verse 38, Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Okay. Jesus goes into this meal loving um, Judas, uh, loving uh, Peter, loving the disciples in a uh, one-way love. In other words, is he expecting anything in return from these guys? I mean, nothing. Like with Judas, is he ever, is there like this far distant spot where he's going to get something in return from Judas? I mean, you could argue, well, he knew that Peter was going to go and do and be, and the other guys, okay, maybe, maybe, but I don't think so. He comes to this table, and he is willing to serve. He's willing to wash their feet. He's willing to feed them. He's willing to give them the seat of honor. He's willing to pursue them and love them. And he is willing to do it with absolutely zero expectations, with no sense of anything in return. All right, let me, let me try to pivot into something here because I think this is the, the, the crux of this is a new command I give you, love one another. As I, has lo I have loved you, so you must love one another. Okay, uh, Jesus um, is... Um, he is willing to fully love uh, with no expectation of return. So, so let's define sort of what love is or define, um, divine love versus human love. So I would say here, we see that divine love is not a feeling. Does Jesus have any good feelings towards these guys? Like go there. Does he have any good feelings toward Judas? Probably not. Is it a physical urge? No. Is it a sexual feeling? No. Is it an idea? A preference? Is it butterflies in his stomach? Is it a response to, or, or attention, a human response to attention from someone you think is attractive? <coughs> what is love then? If Jesus is demonstrating so clearly here, this is divine love. What is it? It is a long-term 
day in, day out choice to be willing to serve and to sacrifice with absolutely no response, no acknowledgement, no thank you. Jesus' love is sacrificial, selfless, understanding, forgiving. Let me say this again to y'all because we got to get this. Divine love is a long-term, day-in and day-out choice to be willing to serve and to sacrifice with no response, no acknowledgement, and no thank you. So the question becomes, how well do we as humans do with loving people with divine love? Divine love. Oh, man. I'm glad somebody was honest. Thank you. Okay, so let, let's open this door, and we're going to kind of tiptoe it down in just a minute. Most human relationships have an element of a business contract, right? We have a landscaping business, and we write these contracts, and we're like, you know, we'll do this and this and this, and we'll do it this way, and we'll do it at this time, and then you're going to pay us this, right? And if somebody breaks the contract, what's the other person do? <laughs> Done. Bye. Bye. You didn't pay me, you know, right? Come on, that's business, yeah? Well, well, sadly, most of our human relationships actually downgrade into some type of business contract, even marriage. I expect that I'm gonna do these couple of things and you're gonna do these couple of things. And what happens when one of the people stop doing their couple of things? Flip analogies here. A best friendship. Go back to my little opening story. I expected, not that this guy was going to come to my aid or he was going to rescue me. or he, No, I didn't really even care what was happening to me. I cared about the friendship. But I did expect that he would at least step into the circle and try to help me or say something or do something, right? And when he didn't do that, what do you think happened with our friendship? It broke. We've never been friends again. I mean, really, it's like, oh my goodness. So what, you, what I'm inviting you even in to begin to think about here is it's actually, Jesus says it in Matthew 5, verses 46 and 47. But he says, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Don't even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus, at some level, um, understood that divine love was this unrequited love, this love as a one-way street, this love where he was willing to sacrifice it all with no response and nothing given in return. And I want to say today, as we pivot into our personal lives, the goal of today is, number one, um, to understand Jesus' divine love, um, the costly act of Jesus' divine love towards us, and then make application as how we're to call to love one another, okay? Y'all are sort of tracking with me and sort of not. That's okay. We're going to see if we can get there. <laughs> okay, in a marriage, I am convinced that if you take two people and one person is willing to love with a divine love, what am I saying? Let me go back and read it. A long-term, day-in, day-out choice to be willing to serve and sacrifice with no response, no acknowledgement, and no thank you. You'll have a good marriage. One person. I'm convinced that if two people are willing to come together and love with that type of selfless divine love, like we see Jesus extending towards Judas, Jesus extending towards John, Jesus extending towards Peter, Jesus extending towards the disciples, that you will actually have a marriage that is heavenly, because all of a sudden you're not getting up, going about expecting that the person meets your needs. You follow me? This is what kids need from us as parents more than anything else, to know that they are loved unconditionally without, there is nothing that will cause us to pull that love back. There is, even if they do everything wrong, if they make every wrong choice, if they do everything they could possibly do under the sun, that we will always love them. Does that mean we're gonna put up with it? No. Does that mean we're always going to let them live in our house? No. But that means that you always love them. You always are extending love towards them.
It's interesting as we look at Jesus even talking to Peter because Peter's about to betray Jesus. But Peter is unstable, he's inconsistent, he's impulsive, um, and he's immature, but he's also lovable. I mean, Jesus must have known in this moment the, the Peter's both loyalty, but also the weakness of his resolve. And, and somehow Jesus sees through Peter in this final interaction that we just read, he sees through the coward and he finds the loyal person that Jesus, that Peter would ultimately be martyred for his faith. And so what I'm, what I'm proposing to you here is if you can begin, number one, to recognize that this is a God of love and receive that type of love from him. It's what Dwayne talked about in his song up here. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to change anything. You don't have to change yourself. You just come and you receive love. It's Jesus sitting at the table with Judas, giving the person who was gonna hurt him the most the best seat at the house, giving John, giving Peter who was gonna betray him three times all, the, the, the absolute best of what he had. All of these people. Do you know of all those 12 who was at the cross when Jesus died? John. Where did the other 10 go? Bye. Do you feel the betrayal? And yet Jesus is willing to love with a love that is a one-way street. If you can receive that type of love from this God, and then you're able to begin to turn and lay down your expectations and your desires and the way you think your spouse or your friend or your kids should respond, and you're able simply to extend that same costly type of divine love towards people, irrespective of how they respond, you will begin to see the power and presence of the kingdom of God injected into your human relationships. If you want to see a transformation in a marriage or in a relationship, you begin to uh, give and extend this type of love that is without looking for a thank you or a response. When, when, I, when I stand back in our marriage at points with Abby and I, there's things that will happen, and I'll be like, well, aren't you going to say thank you? <laughs> you? Do you hear me? Don't even tell me you're not sitting in the same spot, right? We are so, like, we are so self-centered. And we're like, did you see what I did? <laughs> Come on, is that right? Yeah? I cleaned the kitchen. <laughs> well, good for you. <laughs> I mowed the grass. I washed the clothes. I earned a paycheck. I mean, do you hear me? Like, we get so base and so silly, and all of a sudden, we take what God intended to be heavenly and supernatural and amazing, and we reduce it to the silliest human forms because we're like, well, I cleaned the bathroom. Aren't you going to say thank you? <laughs> you hear me? Like we, and now we could also take it with our kids. We could take it with roommates. We could take it with people in our college dorms. We could take it, I could take it every single step where instead of choosing what Jesus chose, which is the way of sacrifice, the way of self-depreciation, the way of laying down my life, the way of choosing to serve, the way of cleaning the bathroom again and again, Do you hear me? You want to change a relationship, you change the contract and the expectation, and you take out that contract and you tear that thing up, and you go, you know what? I am going to love you fully with this supernatural divine love that I have received from him in such a way that I expect no thank you, no admonition, no public praise. And what they will begin to sense from you is this level of freedom and grace. And guess what's going to happen? It might take a few months. It might take a few years. Some people might be particularly hard-hearted. And it might take a few decades even. But you will begin to see a response. Did Judas ever respond? Did Jesus stop loving? I realize what I'm calling you into is a huge revelation of this reckless love of God who was willing to love in a one-way street. And if you today, 
if we as people today are willing to love other people on a one-way street expecting nothing in return, you will begin to speak and inject the kingdom of God into that relationship. You'll begin to see, if only you change, you'll begin to see change. Abby and I were let me say two things here because we have time. This is a sticky subject. I'm going to bring it up anyway. When I was in college at UNCW, um, I had a real dear friend. Uh, not a best friend. <laughs> a dear friend. And uh, he called me up and he said, Michael, I'm going to sleep with my girlfriend. What do you think? Now, he knew I'm a Christian. He knew I'm this, like, preacher guy. I was wearing my no sex ring at the time, which I don't know how I feel about, by the way, in retrospect. Um, I believe in purity all the way, but the whole, you know, I, you got to walk that out carefully. But he called me and he said, hey, I'm going um, I'm, I'm to sleep with my girlfriend, but I wanted to just talk to you about it first. I said, great, let's talk. I said, tell me what you're thinking. And he said, well, we love each other. And I said, okay. I said, so are you sleeping with her for her? And he said, uh, I guess not. I said, well, are you going to marry her? I don't know. Are you going to provide for her? I don't know. What if y'all get pregnant? Are you going to raise a kid together? I don't know. So why are you sleeping with her? I guess for me. Jesus is not the original spoil sport. In other words, he doesn't want to ruin your good time. He actually wants to set you up to experience this divine love. The reason he calls things like sex being in a place of marriage and not in a place of rampant, you know, people and random people is because that is the spot where you see divine love illustrated because it's not I'm here today and I'm gone tomorrow. It's tied to long-term commitment. It's tied to provision and love and protection of one another and serving one another. There's this context that everything God does, he is actually calling for this reckless divine love to come into our human spheres and interactions. And we fight him on it, resist him on it, and we go, I'm going to do it my own way. Now, let me also say, because there's a few of you in the room who are like, oh my gosh, I'm sleeping with somebody right now. This is what the cross of Christ is for. You go, Lord Jesus, would you forgive me? You tell a trusted friend or two, and you start to change. Sometimes I've counseled uh, couples that are living together. I go, okay, great, you're getting married, and now you're living together. I'm gonna encourage you to like, just move into separate rooms for a couple months, why? Now go there a second, wrestle with me. Why would I say to a, a couple that's living together, they're gonna get married, y'all move into separate rooms for a second? Because it breaks the self-centered cycle of love. You see what I'm saying? L love is not a feeling. Love is not a, an idea. Love is not a persuasion or a position. Love is actually the choice day in and day out to lay down your life, lay down your preferences, lay down everything for another person. Love is what Jesus did on a cross, and he says, now go and love each other like that. So why would I look at a married couple and say, hey, just move into separate rooms for a couple months? Because you break the cycle of I'm here just to use you. You hear me? Most relationships, most friendships, most roommate situations are built on this human thing that you do what I expect you to do when you do it and I will love you. We'll be friends. But the moment you violate it, what? I'm out. And see, God is actually saying, clean that entire slate. No, 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 no. You come to this spot where you go, I am here to love, to serve, to lay down, to give it all, not just once, but again and again and again. And you watch when you come to that spot where you are willing to receive that type of lavish love, and then you begin to give that type of lavish love, you will begin to see lives around you transformed. Abby and I were sitting on a, a, the intercoastal uh, waterway the other day with, with our, our two little, little ones, and the, um, the water was perfectly slick, like sheet glass, like one of those days where you can perfectly see this, the clouds and the sky and the water, and you can't even tell the difference between um, the water and the sky because the water is just so slick. You know what I'm talking about? Nobody's around. It's early. 
and this little 12 foot like John boat comes by. It's a little engine on the back of the boat. And I'm just watching, I'm just sitting there. And I looked at my watch and it was about 90 seconds after this boat left, disappeared. All of a sudden these waves started breaking at our feet. When a person begins to trade up, to upgrade into an understanding of divine love, where we begin to break the cycle of this used based need meeting, self-centered thing that we call love in human relationships. It is just like uh, the, the, the displacement of the water of that little boat. Bzzz, tiny little boat on the water. And yet 90 seconds later, two minutes later, we are feeling the waves come in on us. Listen to me. If you as a person, if you're the only one in your house, if you're the only one in your marriage, if you're the only one in your family, if you're the only one in your roommate situation, can begin to understand what this type of love is, and then you can begin to actually extend it to the people around you. You are, you are creating this like draft or displacement where everyone can begin to experience the endless effort love of Jesus. It is so powerful and people will never be the same. You want to transform people's lives. You begin to help them understand and see and experience experientially love that demands nothing in return. It will transform people like that little boat and then the waves. And the waves keep going, and the waves keep going, and the waves keep going. And what happens is pretty soon if a bunch of us are out there on the water of life and we're all making our Jesus waves, you get a whole group and a society that actually experiences a God awakening. Every revival that's ever happened in the history of the world happens that way. It's when a group of men and women and young people begin to experience this God awakening of what is divine love, and then they begin to extend it everywhere they go. Worship team, are y'all out here? Come on out. Here's what I would love to invite you into doing. I'm not sure what song y'all have planned. Doesn't really matter. But I would love to invite us as a church, and I'm gonna ask you just to do um, business in the, in the quietness of your own heart. Um, but I would love to invite us as a church to take a step in going, I am willing to love with an un, um, unrequited one-way love. Does that make sense? I am willing to begin to love a spouse, a roommate, a friend, with this one-way Jesus-centered love that expects nothing in return, no thank you, no attaboy, no way to go, just to do like Jesus did and lay it all down, to give his best to someone who was gonna betray and walk away, to give his best from someone who was gonna deny him three times, to give his best to a group of guys who in his hour of greatest need were gonna hit the road and run away. Let's stand to our feet. And if I want to invite you to do something different in this closing song. It doesn't really matter what it is. If you've never lifted your hands in worship, you may just want to do that. Go, Lord, I'm, I'm just going to take my little step. Never closed your eyes in worship. Maybe just close your eyes. If you've never come forward, come on forward prayer team, perhaps you guys would come and be available. But whatever you're doing, do something that is a significant marker that you are choosing to step out beyond your human demand for love. And you're going to attempt to love in this divine way that expects no response. Let's worship together.
for us as a church, those gathered here in person, those online, that we would be a group that would fully receive your divine love for us. Not because of anything we've done or even failed to do, but just because of who you are. And Father, I pray that as you change our hearts with that type of love, that we would become a group of people who's willing to love with that long-term, day-in, day-out choice to serve, to sacrifice with no response, no acknowledgement, and no thank yous. And Father, I pray that as we do that, we would be a church of people who are transforming people. Father, I'm convinced that when you transform us, you call us to go and transform others. Father, I pray for everyone in here. I pray for anyone who might even feel guilt or shame because of something I've mentioned or talked about. Father, I pray that you would take that from them, extending your forgiveness, extending your grace, extending your life. 
Father, I pray you would make all things new. Father, if there's someone in here who's never surrendered their life to you, given their life to you and started new and afresh, Lord, I pray they'd come up and we could do that today. If you're online and you've never given your life to this Jesus, we'd love to pray with you. Put your name in the content comment section and we'll get back with you. Father, as we gather as a church today and as we gather again next week, I pray that you would go before us and you'd come behind us and you would make us progressively more deeply and intimately acquainted with this divine love of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.